our purpose as Kareem and as the Kareem Super App is to simplify everyday life. We think life in this region can be needlessly complex. I'll go on record to say the silver bullet for any multifunctional app going forward, which offers more than maybe four to six services, is actually the UI of their app. One of the things that again has really allowed us to win customer loyalty in this region is customer service. So when a, when many of our competitors, whether in mobility or in food delivery, were removing voice, we have never removed voice. Kareem Pay's purpose is very much in line with Kareem's purpose. Our purpose is to simplify lives, and you cannot simplify life without simplifying payments. It's pretty much as simple as that. I want to welcome you to the second season of Couchonomics with Arjun. Join us this season as we go beyond fintech and payments and embark on the journey into the future of financial services, a future which will be shaped by existing and new developments in technology and innovation, including and not limited to the likes of embedded finance, open banking, ESG, various versions of metaverse, decentralized finance, digital currencies, and other trends. On the couch, we're going to have the most influential and progressive-minded founders, executives, investors, regulators, innovators, and industry commentators from across the MENA region and beyond. Join us as we unravel a multitude of layers of the financial services industry and try to learn how technology will continue to impact the world that we live in. Couchonomics with Arjun is proud to collaborate with some of the most respected and innovative names in the world of payments, fintech, and technology. Audion is a reliable end-to-end -end payment solution that provides innovation and flexibility to help businesses achieve their ambition faster by turning payments into a strategic growth driver. Get everything you need with TuYu, a Saudi-based super app for delivery, mobility, on-demand services, and a lot more. TuYu connects you to everything you need to enrich your daily lives by building an ecosystem across its end consumers, merchants, and reps. Visa is a world leader in digital payments with a mission to connect the world through the most innovative, convenient, reliable, and secure payments network to enable individuals, businesses, and economies to thrive. GDA is a leading fintech and payment solution provider founded in Saudi Arabia expanding rapidly across the region with established operations in UAE and Egypt. GDS vision is to empower merchants with the tools to start, manage and grow their business. M2P pioneers next-gen fintech through innovative offerings across payments, lending and banking landscapes. Their comprehensive tech stack powers end-to-end -end banking services, BNPL, customized credit cards, prepaid cards and more. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of Couchonomics with Arjun. I'm your host, Arjun, and joining me today on the couch is Madhya Satar. Uh, Madhya leads the fintech arm of Kareem, and I'm sure all of you are aware of Kareem with all the, with all the news which has been going around uh, for the past week. So with that, I wanted to welcome Madhya to the couch. Thank you, Arjun. Excited to be here. Well, and, and I'm very happy you could take time out of your schedule and join us. Yeah, it's a Friday afternoon, so what better way to spend a Friday afternoon? <laughs> than than yeah. with me, yeah. right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not quite sure lots of people agree with that, but I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah. That's a good place to start. That's a good place to start. But yeah, firstly, congratulations, I guess, on, uh, on behalf of the entire Kareem team. I think the $400 million raise... Uh, I think is both an endorsement of, I guess, the work you guys have been doing mm. and obviously the vision that you guys were able to articulate to Ed Salat or Ian, as I should refer to, refer to them as. Um, um, and But before we sort of get into... Uh, uh, into the details of, yeah. of the super app and the raise, I think I'm particularly interested to understand your, your own journey, sort of, you know, so how do you get... How did you get to where you are in Kareem today? Yeah, uh, thank you, Arjun, for the congratulations. Uh, it has been an exciting week. 
um, and a very busy few months leading up to this. So we're all uh, excited to finally be able to share the news and we'll get into that. Um, but me personally, I born and brought up in Karachi uh, in Pakistan. Uh, I've had a few different careers and paths uh, to get here. Uh, went to U.S. for university and actually studied history and literature uh, for my undergrad. Very close to fintech. <laughs> and then like any good South Asian kid, I went into banking and management consulting, okay. as one does. Uh, so I uh, worked in New York for a while, worked at uh, a couple of global banks, uh, worked in uh, consulting, uh, worked as a journalist for a period of time uh, and not a fintech or financial journalist. I had an interest, I still have an interest in writing and in politics. So I moved back to Pakistan and was basically a political journalist for about five years. Oh, wow. Which was a complete detour, but thoroughly with, enjoyable. With, with, that, with all due respect, yeah. journalism, politics in Pakistan is fairly fun. And by the way, it was 2008 to 13, which was a super intense time okay. for <laughs> political journalism in Pakistan, okay. uh, which we, uh, we maybe is whole, another conversation. We need a whole different episode Correct. for that one, right? But uh, then made my way back to, again, like a good South Asian kid, Went back to corporate life, uh, uh, joined uh, JP Morgan and their corporate strategy team, global corporate strategy team. Eventually made my way to Dubai when my husband and I got married. He was a Dubai kid. I was living in the US. Long distance was getting too painful. Moved here and um, worked uh, as head of strategy for a regional media organization, which was the uh, regional arm of 21st Century Fox, but then eventually made my way to Kareem. And at that point, uh, we had what was called Kareem Now. We were launching Kareem Now, which was our food delivery app. Yep. We were not a super app back then. Mm -hmm. So I helped launch that, that joined that team, uh, helped to launch that business, um, then helped to launch our groceries business, which back then was called Shops. We didn't have the dark store format we have today, but we had a marketplace shops business. Uh, launched that actually during COVID, so it was a pretty exciting time for growth of that business. Uh, then helped launch the super app, and then finally landed at Kareem Pay uh, two two years and a quarter ago. Okay. So uh, several different roles at Kareem and several different businesses, but always at startups within Kareem. Okay, uh, actually never been a part and, of the right And a fairly business. diverse group, a lot Correct. of place, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my role now sort of connects back to my financial services experience and my past lives. Um, but what's been great about the last four and a half years at Kareem is just the incredible learning on tech uh, yeah. has been fantastic. And, and to personally. be honest with you, I, I, I do think that, you know, uh, uh, with this term super app or multi-product apps or everything apps, I think people don't fully understand, or at least most people don't fully comprehend that actually financial services is a very important glue around all of it, right? I think technology gets the credit of being the glue. Mm -hmm. I do think that financial services is also a glue, if not equally important. Yeah. So let's flick back to the $400 million mm -hmm. question, right? So what does that really mean for the Kareem growth story? Yeah, it's, uh, well, at the highest level, what it means is that we now have two phenomenal partners, mm -hmm. uh, not just one, right? Uh, obviously, we've had Uber as a tremendous partner, and now we have a great regional partner in the form of EAND. And as you know, and many of your listeners might know, uh, EAND has been on a journey to transform themselves from a regional telco to a technology and investment company, sure. uh, the region, right? So this is quite in line with their strategy as well. And the idea for us is that, look, uh, in terms of what it brings for Kareem, EAND unlocks not just funding, obviously, but also a very large user base. Their geographic footprint is very, very overlapping with ours. Mm -hmm. uh, regulatory relationships and licenses, number of other partnerships. So obviously, they bring a tremendous amount for us. Um, and of course, we have now a decade of experience building consumer internet products mm -hmm. um, and sort of how to launch those types of products and grow those types of products in this region with all of its operational challenges and all of its complexities, right? And really for us, what it means is that, look, if you look at the three, this is what we're calling chapter three. Mm -hmm. right? So chapter one was we, were, we became the leading tech-enabled mobility provider of the mm -hmm. region, right? Um, so that was, and the other element of our purpose then was also to build an incredible tech organization that inspires the region, right? So for really for young people in the region and for older people in the region, uh, just say, look, we can do this too. We can grow a tech company from this region that is world-class and uh, that spawns entrepreneurship. And when we had the exit to Uber, uh, we had many colleagues who then were able to take their 
pay out from that deal and mm-hmm. go on to launch 100 plus startups right mm-hmm. so that was chapter 1 for us chapter 2 was uber and being part of the uber family and really learning so much from this incredible tech company mm-hmm. right um and also learning how to be a grown up company and 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 learning so much from them and um in addition to sort of providing so much value to our ride hailing business they also helped us invest in proving the super app story which okay. we did in dubai um and we really have proved it and we can get into the stats around that and and why we think we've more than proven the case in dubai of uh, a super app or an everything app and now the idea is we want to build industry leading verticals in all of those areas and um three things one scale those verticals we have fintech we have food we have groceries we have a platform for third party apps mm-hmm. in dubai we have for example just life that's provides yep. cleaning so swap that provides rental yep. tickety that provides tickets so we are becoming a platform for the ecosystem mm-hmm. so one idea is one one piece of the story is to scale all of these into industry leading verticals second piece of the story is being able to invest in awareness pivoting your brand from a ride hailing brand to an everything app is not straightforward right so you have to invest in that brand awareness and building that brand and that is also something we'll invest in um and then also geographic expansion so we are a super app in dubai we have a few services in some cities in ksa mm-hmm. but we are not a super app in all of our markets mm-hmm. in all of our 10 markets mm-hmm. right and so those are the three areas where those uh, this investment will go okay so so that begs a couple of questions right so the first question is you know uber i i don't know when but about 5 7 8 years ago obviously stated that they also wanted to to become more than just a ride hailing mm-hmm. app i don't know if they refer to the term super app or mm-hmm. or not uh but then pulled out of that story entirely right and in complete entirety uh so so you know first question and let me finish both the questions then you can choose to answer which is what is it that you saw differently as kareem mm-hmm. that uber didn't right um the second part of that question here is um why do you believe that the super app story will work in the markets that you play right because uh you know vast majority of the of the western world including europe has not really seen any super app yes mm-hmm. we've seen products which offer more than a service correct but if you were to take the definition of a super app which gets coined out of the eastern part of the world mm-hmm. china specifically but even mm-hmm. southeast asia what makes you believe that there is a demand for a super app and one could actually succeed So yeah. first the upper question then the second question and then And they're actually very linked right I guess they so, are So so yeah, yeah absolutely and and Uber has made selective bets right in certain services that are not mobility so food delivery for them Uber Eats has been a great story for yeah. them right and that was actually uh as a result of covid i mean it was something that got them through covid and really came out as a real success story where that diversification really helped right mm-hmm. they've also expanded that into grocery deliveries in certain markets um and there are other mobility use cases that they are also expanding into beyond ride hailing right so they are they are placing selective bets that go beyond mobility yep. right now we've taken that a little bit further uh and we've said we want to simplify everyday life for the user so that's sort of our purpose as cream and as the cream super app is to simplify everyday life we think life in this region can be needlessly complex and by the way dubai is not this region right I totally agree uh, so so life is needlessly complex in many of the 10 countries that cream operates in right and there is a we th- we feel a particular need for an everything app in this region and i'll give you a couple of reasons why one is you mentioned europe you mentioned the us those markets have had significantly more time building consumer internet companies right so they have industry leading experiences and companies in many verticals right you have an individual app that's really really great at providing this particular service it's been around for two decades or one decade or 1.5 decades it's built a great experience if you look in our region there are much fewer specialist apps that are really really great at what they provide right agreed do you have and and those service levels and that quality in every single vertical you don't have entrenched apps that have really won the customer trust and are delivering great experience in that vertical right okay so when it comes to delivering quality experiences we don't have that many apps delivering phenomenal experiences in our markets right which creates an opportunity for more of an app that can look we've spent a decade figuring out how to crack operations in this, in these markets right and that is knowledge that we can leverage and our experience building tech on a number of different verticals 
the purpose being to deliver great experiences across a number of different verticals, mm -hmm. right? So that's one. We just think there's a space there because you don't have these specialist apps that are delivering great experiences, right? Another thing is trust. So customers trust Kareem with their cards on file, with their payment information, with their login, with their identity, with their locations. That And it's a brand that customers trust, right? Mm -hmm. That's a trust that we've spent a decade building, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we still have in our market users who are not comfortable putting their card information on, on yeah, websites, yeah. on apps, et cetera, right? So there's a trust gap where we feel we've earned that trust now that we can build on and become like the place that customers can come to, trust their information, trust their payment methods, and going back to the first point, trust that we'll deliver a great experience, right? So we are a known and trusted brand. We bring a decade of tech product building and operational experience where we can we think we can deliver great experiences across a number of verticals, right? So those are a couple of different reasons. The third reason I think that's super important is the TAMS, totally addressable market, in many of our markets for many verticals in dollar terms are not necessarily massive, just based on the earnings power, yeah. right? And so for you to really scale as a company, you, you probably need to be in more than one or two things, right? And your your TAM, and by the way, that's why FinTech is, and, let, and going back to your point of, we've actually, we may have been a mobility company for a decade, but actually we've also been a payments company for yeah, a decade. Have, right? yeah. and, and so, and then the FinTech TAM is massive, right? It's way bigger than the food delivery TAM or the grocery delivery TAM. Right? So if you're really going to be a scaled company in this region, you sort of have to be in multiple verticals. Right? So. But there, you and me have met a few times, but we don't know each other that well. Yeah. Um, I'm not one who agrees on everything, and that's sort of the nature of the show. Yeah. So, so while I, I, I think on number two, you're hitting it out of the park as Kareem. I totally agree with you. I think you guys have built the trust, and and a very good proxy for that trust is are people willing to put their card on file? Mm -hmm. And there are a number of apps that you know. Uh, in my day job, I come across people who do who have similar challenges mm. in terms of how do they actually make customer journeys a little bit better? Mm. How do they increase the time? I think you guys have hit it. I think I agree with you on the, on the third point that you've also made, which is uh, uh, the, the addressable TAM uh, on some of these isolated or individual SKUs, mm. if you make my well, categories, are not sufficient enough. So mm. it makes perfect sense. To, to go in. And I think Uber going into Uber Eats was a great example, mm -hmm. although they're in a much bigger market, mm -hmm. because there are some synergies which I'm sure the mobility part of the business provides them. Uh, they, you know, they have a customer base so they can actually cross sell Correct. sort of a service, which is you ask for something to come to you, if I may mm -hmm. simplify it. The bit which I do struggle with mm -hmm. is that. And again, the jury is out for me as far mm -hmm. as concerned. I'm not saying I say it won't work, which is. Is there is there a need? While I do understand that the number of, uh, as you said, leading internet companies mm -hmm. are limited, it's also down to the consumers that you're interacting mm -hmm. with, right? Uh, I'm just a marketer one, so by no means a proxy. I tend to sort of sometimes gravitate away from actually one app serving me everything to having the choice, because I still believe choice is king, mm -hmm. right? And then, if I actually just answer that question, I think it's a question rather than, than, than me saying anything is, if you look at historically over the last sort of decade and a bit longer, every super app which is backed by a ride hailing backbone mm -hmm. is still unprofitable, mm -hmm. right? Grab being the biggest example. I think they're in year 11 and they still have you know, announced a whopping loss mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the last quarter. Now, they're narrowing their losses mm -hmm. down. I do agree with you. Yeah. But it's taken them 11 years. And I actually worked not for Grab, but worked mm -hmm. with them very closely mm -hmm. for four years in Southeast Asia because I used to work on the merchant side at that time and I used to run a, a, a fintech. Mm -hmm. So I saw the Grab story going from Grab. Why do you believe this time the story is going to be different yeah. for a business which is still built on the back of a ride hailing app? Yeah, I think it's a great question, Arjun, and a very relevant question, obviously, given what's been happening uh, over the last couple of years in terms of tech valuations, right? But a couple of things. One is ride hailing, we actually, at least speaking for Kareem, our ride hailing business is profitable in several of our markets. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one thing. And food delivery is almost at break even. 
So we are a bit further along in terms of... Uh, now, of course, we have some growth bets. Green pay is a growth bet. Grocery delivery is a growth bet. Those yeah, are much growth, earlier in the, the journey. The Saudi Arabia, grocery delivery is a profitable business. Yeah. So so there are so there's some of our businesses that are already on, have achieved or are on the path to profitability. A uh, couple of other things come into play. What are the assets we're going to use to drive that profitability, right? One is both from a tech perspective and an operational perspective, mobility actually lends itself to, we consider these adjacent verticals, right? Agreed. Like you said, grocery delivery, food delivery, it's a three-sided marketplace. We've added one leg. It used to be a two-sided marketplace with ride hailing. Now you've got a third, which is the merchant or the restaurant. Or yeah, yeah, and you is. add the flywheel. But you've got to dispatch works. the captain. Yeah. You've got to price the trip. You've got to, all of these different things. There's a ton of operations and tech that goes into it that is very leverageable and scalable across these different use cases. Similarly for FinTech, we've been accepting payments, both cash and digital, mm -hmm. for 11 years for Kareem, right? Yes. So we've built a certain amount of scale and expertise and are able to spread our costs across these across the scale from a FinTech perspective. So there is, there is a scale argument here as well, right? Um, and lastly, what we've all been through, not just Kareem but other tech companies, but I can speak for Kareem, over the last three years, uh, one was COVID. Uh, that was a big shock to the system. Obviously, ride healing was down ninety mm percent, -hmm. and uh, we at that point doubled down on our what we call mobility of things businesses. Yeah. But also, we really had to cut back, right? Uh, unfortunately, we ha we did have to let a lot of people go, um, we, and we also made some structural changes to the cost base of our business outside of that as well, right? So we just became much leaner when that happened. And then one thing we learned in the last, let's say, year, year and a half, which other tech companies in this region did not have to go through, we are part of the Uber family. And Uber is a publicly listed company yep. in the US. So for them, the last X number of months have been laser focused on profitability, right? And interestingly, even though Kareem is a tiny part of the Uber budget, that came down to us as well. Yeah, totally. And we had to get super sharp uh, for the last X, I can tell you, if I tell you the size of my marketing budget, you will laugh, right? So we have been, we have really, when I, when me, I mean Kareem Pei, um, we really took a good hard look at our cost base again about a year ago and took a number of steps to reduce it. Uh, thankfully, we did not have to do another round of, of uh, letting people go, but we instituted hiring freezes in many places. We've taken out a lot of cost in the system in terms of just inefficient spend. Uh, we've made some structural improvements in terms of, tech and leveraging tech better. So there's a number of things we've done that perhaps other companies in this region didn't go through that necessarily. So I think coming out of that, we're in a pretty good... Uh, it makes you a leaner and a meaner a, machine. Absolutely. Yeah, and I agree with you. And listen, the, the obvious next step from here and after this funding round is at some point, we're going to have to have another exit, right? Yeah. And in order, and if that is an IPO, in order for us to do that, our PNL is going to have to look a certain way. Yeah, agreed. And so... We don't really, in this new world, you don't really have a choice anymore if you're going to. No, uh, I agree with you. I agree yeah, with you. Yeah. So, so let's move on a little bit. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into a little bit more detail if you're comfortable yeah. in terms. So, so, so the way I envision, and, and from what I've read, and I did read the, 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 the third, as you call it. The, chapter three. The chapter three uh, 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 blog, uh, which I think uh, Mudassar and the other founders had sort of written or co-authored. Um, uh, very interesting. So what the way I understood or the way I read it is, mm -hmm. We're still going to have one Kareem map, mm -hmm. right? Um, ride healing is going to continue sitting on it, right? Uh, and uh, all the other services are going to come around it. How's the governance going to work? Yeah. There's a lot of legal agreements behind the scenes on this one. No, no, yeah, forget, yeah. For, okay, forget the legal side. No, no, of no. It, of course, right? I was joking. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm talking in terms of like customer journey. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Uh, so how's... So how's that be? Or is that still work in progress, and you're not in a position to? No, we, so, we we know what the principles are, right? right? That that we know already, right? right? So 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 the way it works is, and and this is obviously public. It's available on the blog. Kareem Technologies is a new company. Yep. It's owned by E and and Uber. Yep. And the co-founders yep. and all the Kareem colleagues. Yep. All getting equity in that piece. Then there is Kareem Rides, which yep. is being separated into a separate legal entity, which is owned by Uber. Right. Right. But from a customer perspective, and this is really the key here. The customer shouldn't have to care about any of this. It doesn't. Right? And so on the super app, unless Rides is delivering a fantastic experience and everything else is also delivering a fantastic experience, it's not going to work. Right? And so we have set in place a number of sort of service level agreements, arrangements, org structure, etc., 
such that we ensure that Kareem Rights continues both driving customer acquisition for the Kareem Super App yeah. and that everything else on the Kareem Super App, all of the backbone of the Kareem Super App is still being made available to Kareem Rights, right? right? So for example, there is some cross-cutting technology that makes the Kareem Super App run. Payments yep. is one of them. Yep. Identity, user identity is another. Yep. Uh, locations is another. Yep. Those are central Kareem level teams that provide these assets to all the different Kareem verticals. And by the way, to third parties, Just Life is one example. And we're going to have to ensure that we continue providing that to a super high degree of quality to Kareem rights. Okay. Right? And at the same time, Kareem rights will have to ensure that the, their experience that they are delivering to customers is on point. Because if a customer churns from Kareem rights, they've churned from the Kareem super app. And, 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 that's, and, that is, and that's kind of where, you know, uh, I think it's both the challenge and the opportunity, right? Uh, and, and it actually gets terribly exciting as far as guys like me are concerned, because although I'm not an engineer, but I'm an engineer at heart, which is, in all intensive purposes, if I was to just look at this from a product perspective, Rides is a service provider into the ecosystem of what you're going to call Kareem Super App, right? Um, say more. I didn't follow Rides so, being a service so, so provider. So Rides, so mm -hmm. you, you, in all intensive purposes, you could take Uber Rides out mm -hmm. and you could put somebody else in providing mm -hmm. the same service. Yes, so it's a vertical. Actually, we it's think of everyone as a vertical. Food delivery is a vertical. Right. Kareem Rides is a vertical. But some verticals are internal. Correct. And some verticals are semi yep. external, right? Yep. And, 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 and in this scenario, obviously Uber sits on both sides of the, the fence, right? Mm -hmm. it, it obviously owns wholly the, the Rides business Correct. and uh, partially the, 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 the uh, technologies business, Correct. right? So, so it's going to be an interesting uh, dance in 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 in, in, in yeah. my in my opinion because uh, if it was a separate vertical by itself mm -hmm. let's assume i go and sign up a cleaning service company yeah. for the sake of argument you know they come on board you provide them all the services that you've mentioned whether it's mm -hmm. payments identity identity management and so on mm -hmm. and so forth they hit a certain amount of slas mm -hmm. but they have very little influence on what happens on the other side of the fence yes here is actually going to be quite interesting yeah. so 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 to me that was actually the bit which I, I was struggling first to comprehend yeah. because at one time I was thinking you're going to, you know, spawn off a separate app and no, that was like, that, that defeats, defeats the, the entire purpose. purpose. Right? And the way the structure is set up, incentives are aligned, right? This is the beauty of the structure because Uber has skin in the game in both companies. Yeah. And that's why incentives are super aligned. No, know? no, I, I totally, I totally get it. Yeah. I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm I, at a, at a hundred thousand feet view, I'm sold on the idea of incentives. It's how the engineering is going to work mm -hmm. in terms of customer journeys. And if you want to radically change how mm -hmm. the right journey works and does that actually create a challenge with you in terms oh, of, absolutely. of that. Also, here's my question to you is, is the profile of the customers who are using the rides going to be the same profile of the customers who are going to use the super apps? So it's, see, I'm a big us, user it's one of customer. Uber. No, no, but it's or, the profile, right? So I am. Yeah. I use Uber twice a day, right? Right, because I don't drive. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I I've come here in an Uber mm -hmm. and I will leave here in an mm -hmm. Uber, right? But I might not be the ideal person who uses your your super app mm -hmm. uh, functionality mm -hmm. because I do want to go to X for my food and mm -hmm. Y for my grocery yes. and Z for my yes. tickets and yeah. L for my, right, right. my, my tickets. Right. So as you said, ride hailing on boards, a lot of customers. Mm -hmm. Are you guys confident that mm -hmm. that customer is the same customer who will actually use your, yeah. uh, so maybe if I can clarify the Uber app remains the Uber app. Yeah. And that is a call that Uber will probably make market by market. But that app remains. Okay. Kareem Rides, which is the current Kareem ride hailing right. offering, which is available on the Kareem Super Kareem App, so. that, continue, that will be owned 100% by Uber. But that customer is the Kareem Super App customer, right? Now, within Rides, yes, there is some segmentation. So, for example, one one um, lovely offering that we have on the Kareem app it's that means RK. a lot to us is the RTA right? Yeah. And so the profile of the customer the who prefers customers Hala prefer. Is a little bit different than Agreed. the profile of the customer who takes the Kareem premium limousine, right? Um, but there are a number of different things they can do on the super app. So, for example, um, we know that uh, a multi service user on the Kareem app, what we call an MSU, mm -hmm. which is someone who uses more than one service on the Kareem super app in Dubai, 
those users have 2x higher retention on the platform and mm-hmm. they have 3x higher usage on the platform. Wow. They're, they're okay. beautiful customers, right? Mm-hmm. Once they start, And by the way, if you're a Kareem Plus customer, which is you're subscribed to our subscription program, you, your stats are way better even than that, right? And so users use multiple services on our platform. Now, there are some users, of course, that use Kareem for Hala. They want to take a Kareem taxi. It's far more convenient I've to hail it. it on the app I, than to hail it, it curbside. Especially when surge rates are going yeah, on, yeah, yeah. I, I use it. Yeah. And then also, if you think about it, some of our offerings are a bit more premium and some are not necessarily tied to an income level. So for example, you could argue that uh, ordering food delivery, especially if it's not on discount, isn't cheap. No. But uh, anyone can send a peer-to-peer money transfer. Mm -hmm. Anyone, a lot of people might need to send a remittance from UAE to Pakistan, which is a service we offer now. Mm -hmm. We all need to pay our dua etislaat bills, which Mm -hmm. you can do on Kareem Pay. So interestingly, the Kareem Pay services are actually broadening the user segment for us as well. Oh, and that and that's that's really exciting for me because I guess yeah. that's my background too yeah. in fintech, and we're going to get there. One last question on the super app, right? So, so, so you're obviously launching an everything app. Um, there are a number of others who are planning to launch similar sort of variations. There are a couple of big retailers who have gotten into the space. Um, there is a, a player who has a VoIP offering, mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, whose company is also buying into the space. Um, and similarly, in Saudi Arabia, there have been a few announcements mm-hmm. that a few people want to sort of migrate mm-hmm. into the super app space. Um, do you not fear that this is going to become a red ocean very quickly? Mm-hmm. So I think you have to know your identity as an everything app. The right. word everything app, also the nuance to that is that what type of everything app are you, yeah. right? We went, you should ask Elon Musk. Yeah. <laughs> when, we, uh, when we went through our super app strategy definition, there were things that we deliberately decided that we're not going to do, mm-hmm. right? So we're not launching a social network, mm-hmm. right? We might might have elements of social embedded into our services, sure. like you might want to, which we don't have yet, but maybe in the future we have, I want to share with you what food I ate, yeah. uh, right? We have launched, for example, group ordering on, yeah. on our food app, uh, for example, but we're not launching a social network. Mm-hmm. We also have decided we're not launching chat. We decided mm-hmm. this three years ago, right? We're not launching entertainment so we're not doing content okay now we could do content that's embedded into our for example i don't know if you've tried or uh, we i'm not sure if this is announced yet okay i'm not gonna go there okay. um but we could have content embedded within our services well, you, you, you could do the, food reviews with, with, at the salat right? you have stars play now possibly have yeah. stars play could be added on but uh, <laughs> but the point is so i'll get to that in a second but one we we know what our what our adjacent verticals are, right? right? Our adjacent verticals typically have something to do with logistics, have something to do with mobility, have something to do with the marketplace where you need to get stuff from point A to B and right, and has something to do with payments, right? So for us, we are, at one point, we used to call ourselves a real world app, yep. right? Um, I like that. We real take on app. operational businesses that are fairly challenging because mm-hmm. they're real world uh, businesses. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't bring on And this is where we become a platform for the ecosystem, right? Where we don't have expertise or we don't have the operations, we're not going to build it ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And so we bought on Just Life as a cleaning company. We bought them on for PCR. We have tickety to sell tickets. I think think anything to do with on-demand services, I think a smart thing to do is to actually build in partnership with somebody because, you know... The scale is just not big enough to continue to build it, and uh, you know I've I've yeah. I've been on the fortunate side that I've actually consulted four super apps in this market mm-hmm. already. Uh, so there are four launches between UAE and Saudi, which will happen where there's a bit of a uh, uh, my company's mm-hmm. sort of uh, name against it. We we built it with them, and I think on on demand services we came across the conclusion each and every time mm-hmm. that the vast majority of them. To build them, the scale is just not there, so you're better off partnering with it. Yeah, I'm going to take you back to your consulting days. Now, okay, that's right. All right. Are we doing a case question? There we, no, no, please yeah, not. There yeah, we I'm go. Not. That, maybe, maybe, I don't. You're very like, perceptive. I'm uh, so went give, through those interviews. Give me the building blocks. Too long give, ago. Give, give me eight or ten building blocks according to you, and obviously you're experiencing right now. What are the ingredients to success of making a good, successful, everything app as you see it or yeah. Kareem sees it? Yeah. So one, reliable, easy and reliable payments is so I love crucial. it. You started with payments. Of well course. done, girl. Well done. It is the backbone. And <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, yeah. You're one preaching simple, to the choir. <laughs> one simple silver bullet we had against Uber in the early days when we were fierce competitors, right? Yeah. 
we accepted cash before they did in our markets yeah, yeah. for ride hailing. And by the way, the origins of the Kareem Pay wallet, back then before it was a regulated wallet and all this, when you got in a ride and you're in Pakistan, you don't have 135 rupees in change. You pay the guy 300 rupees or 500 rupee note because you don't have change. That delta, the 300 and whatever, 55, gets deposited into your Kareem Pay wallet. Mm -hmm. it, you could overpay the captain. And it became a credit balance on Kareem. Awesome. And it was Kareem credit, so this mm -hmm. is not an open loop wallet. You couldn't extract cash out of it. But then once it's there, you use it for your next ride and your next ride and your next ride. So, I mean, this was one of the things we did mm -hmm. a while ago, right? But then, of course, we built the whole payment acceptance, payment processing, all of the gateway integrations, the acquiring integrations, the fraud capabilities, the variety of fraud no, we no, have no, seen we across 13 markets in this region for the last 11 years. Um, so... Reliable and easy payments is super, super important. Um, I think a trusted brand, you asked for 708, so that means I can throw out quite a laundry list actually, but um, no, no, I do a relevant want one. Yeah. yeah. So I think a, uh, a trusted brand. Agreed. Right. Um, and actually within trusted brand, I would add a sub point as a consultant. Um, one of the things that again has really allowed us to win customer loyalty in this region is customer service. So when a, when many of our competitors, whether in mobility or in food delivery, were removing voice, we have never removed voice. We know this region appreciates voice. voice. Right? Yep. We've never gotten rid of it. And by the way, we've experimented with chat, we've experimented with other things, and we have found the right balance between voice and, and, and those other, but you know, it's something we never took away. Kareem Care is something we take very seriously. But it goes back to the point of having a known and trusted brand that customers find reliable, right? So that's an important one. I think another building block is, um, or maybe this is again another sub point of brand, you, that awareness creation is super important. Even to this day, there are users who still think of us as a ride healing company. It's not an easy message to land. And uh, we've gone through one rebrand, there'll probably be more, but landing this idea that actually you can do more than ride hailing on Kareem, right? And I think that any super app probably has to sort of invest and, mm -hmm. and sort of somehow land that message. I, I saw Grab go through that same challenge. Right. Right. Uh, in, in Singapore and in Malaysia and in, yep. uh, in Thailand. And it's not an easy mes yeah, message. Yeah. Right? So I think that landing that message um, and landing what are the cross-cutting value props? So why should I order food on Kareem, right? There has to be some value prop that connects across these different services, right? So that's another one. Um, I think a third one is, or fourth one is, how do you, I don't know, these are overused words, but how do you personalize or customize the experience? No, I think it's very In such important. a way that we're not throwing 17 things at you and we're throwing the same 17 things to everyone. Um, that's really where the secret sauce so, is. So, so I, I'll go on record to say the yeah. silver bullet for any multifunctional app going forward, which offers more than maybe four to six services, mm. is actually the UI mm. of their app. Because the way you engage with that app mm -hmm. is very different than me. Absolutely. And if they're going to throw the same front end, which you get to me, in going to work. <laughs> I, I, I actually think, I know it's yeah. not easy to pull it's off. Not. But technology is now increasingly available. Yeah. You have, you know, tremendous amounts of AI now, which allow you to predict. Mm -hmm. The ability is that, okay, well, you might not have an nth number of UIs. But I do think that you'll have to get better at segmenting your customers mm -hmm. and presenting them with different UIs because yep. you can't have the same eight buttons for everybody. Yeah, yeah. People, I think that's to me the silver bullet, yeah. in, in my humble opinion. Well, it's too, and, and by the way, the reason it's so important is not just because, I mean, one thing is it's a better user experience, yeah. right? So I don't want to see a bunch of stuff that's not relevant to me and it's only going to confuse me further, right? Um, and so obviously you need the obvious things for that data, intelligence on that data, and then obviously an intelligent UI that that uh, drives that, right? Um, but also, if you don't do that, one of the one of the premises of a super app from a from a from a PNL point of view is that your customer acquisition cost should be lower. Yeah, if yeah. it isn't, why do you even have a super app, right? And so, if you're not, and I, there are companies out there that have multiple different apps. They may have the same brand on multiple different apps, but they're still having to acquire customers to like 
five different apps. The whole logic of a super app has to be that you're bringing down your customer acquisition cost, yeah. which you're not going to do if you're not surfacing the most relevant service to the customer and doing it at the right time for that customer. And it's not just about the UI. It's also about your automated comms journeys, your what discounts and offers are you surfacing to whom. Um, we have these what we call automated graduation and activation journeys, which is that if you take a ride, what is the next service we should be pitching you on? If you decide not to do a food delivery, what is the next service we should be pitching for you? What What's relevant to you? And if we aren't relevant to you, we're not going to be able to cross-sell. And if we're not able to cross-sell, we're not going to bring our CAC down. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. And and if I may take the liberty of adding a couple more, because I'm not suggesting that you wouldn't have, is one is I think uh, any super app needs to understand that they're serving multiple customers. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not just the consumer, but also the rep or the person who does the delivery mm -hmm. uh, or whoever is the transient. And obviously the, the supplier or the mm -hmm. merchant, right? So that's very essential. And I guess, you know, if you look at successful sort of flywheels, uh, it's ones who can actually make all the wheels kind of, you know, spin at around the same mm -hmm. rate or at a faster rate. The other one, which I do think, it's, which, which is interesting, and I'm sure you guys have thought this through, is that I think as you expand the number of services on your platform, you are bound to get into partnerships. Absolutely. And if these partnerships don't do don't serve both purposes of increasing TAM and reducing CAC, mm -hmm. in effect, in my humble opinion, their partnership's not worth getting into. Mm -hmm. Right again, I'm a bit being a bit black and white. Yeah. In case, let's get into the world of Kareem Pay. Mm. Tell us what does Kareem Pay entail, and please talk me through some of the milestones that you guys have achieved over the last eleven years in terms of Kareem Pay, and where you know where do you stand today? Yeah. Um, look, Kareem Pay's purpose is very much in line with Kareem's purpose. Our purpose is to simplify lives, and you cannot simplify life without simplifying payments. It's pretty much as simple as that. So we're not trying to be a neobank. Mm -hmm. We're trying to be a player that provides essential payments and financial services as part of an everything app. Sort of what do you need in your daily life? And we will meet those financial services needs. That's, mm -hmm. what, that's what Kareem Pay does, right? Um, now, while we have been enabling payments for Kareem, ride hailing, and their deliveries for the last 11 years, it's actually only last year that we became a fintech in the sense that in the UAE, we launched our digital wallet. This was the first regulated fintech, regulated fintech product that we launched. So last year is when we became a fintech. And actually, we launched a full suite of what I consider a pretty comprehensive suite of fintech products in the UAE. So what we, are those? What, so we launched a digital wallet. Mm -hmm. We launched a peer-to-peer -peer money transfer service. Uh, for those of you who've lived in the US, it's a Venmo or a cash app, but better, I hope. Um, so there's a there's a domestic money transfer service. We've launched international remittance, starting with UAE and Pakistan as our first corridor. We want to perfect it before we open more corridors. Who are you working with there? Lulu. Okay. Um, but of course, the idea in remittance is to have multiple partners, and we acquired Denari last year. Yeah. Um, and so the the way Denari was built was to have multiple partners and providers uh, behind the scenes, right? Okay. Um, to to optimize cost, speed, uh, receiver markets, all of that stuff. So peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, digital wallet, international remittance, bills and recharge. So we have a number of bills use cases. Excellent. Um, quite a few. And now we've started adding some that are not available on Dubai now and other competitors, which is super exciting because they're these sort of bills that people are literally logging on to ancient websites to pay mm. that are now available on, on Green Pay, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the one that I... I love ancient websites. I mean, I'm, okay. I, I'm actually <laughs> going to keep that. <laughs> that's actually I'm actually going to keep that's that. That's a bit of an oxymoron, but you know... No, no, I mean. no, no. It actually like, works very well. Yeah, yeah. I, um, so, and then the, the other one that, or the one that I'm... Actually, let me let me get to my favorite one last. But that was a set of consumer facing ones, payments products that we launched last year in the UAE. Mm -hmm. So it was a very important year for us, like really the beginning of Green Pay. Mm -hmm. We also end of last year and more towards this year have launched a proper effort around our captains. If you think about it, and mm -hmm. we'll talk about the unbanked in a second. But man, we are paying their earnings, right? Why should those go to a bank or to it? They go in. They're not going into a Green Pay wallet. And from there, obviously, the captain is going to send money home. I mean, the vast majority of captains so in the UAE are Pakistan. He or she can do a remittance? 
Yeah. Or he or she can use, uh, uh, I'm assuming there's a prepaid card. Attached. So what we've done for the moment with captains is we have different kinds of captains. Some captains are banked. And for those guys, the Kareem Pay wallet, they just withdraw the money into their bank account, right? Okay. And so we pay them into their wallet. From there, they can send money home to Pakistan. Vast majority of captains in the UAE Pakistani. Or they can pay their due bill, um, or they can send money to you, mm -hmm. or they can get a tip from a customer, or by the way, if they want to take the money out, they just withdraw it to their bank. For the ones that are unbanked, which is still a significant chunk, where we will be issuing cards for those, uh, okay. so and paying them, paying them directly onto that card, right? Okay. Um, and it won't just be a prepaid card; it'll be a card linked to the Kareem Pay wallet. It won't be a sort of a WPS card or one okay. of those, right? Um, so we're super excited about the captain opportunity. The other thing we did in KSA, by the way, where we are not a licensed fintech, but what we enabled through a bank integration, which no other ride hailing, and I think possibly no other marketplace provider is providing, uh, we now settle captain's earnings on demand and instantly into their bank. So the captain completes a ride, he says, I want my earning now, within seconds it's in his bank account. This used to be on a, our competitors are paying captains on like a weekly settlement cycle mm -hmm. and things like that, right? Or even even worse. So um, this whole payouts and captain payments is a big and bigger and bigger topic for us going And forward. it drives stickiness, especially in Saudi Arabia, hmm. where actually captains are not actually, you know, part of large cohorts and their independence. Very Absolutely. Much, it's very much like the US. UAE is the only limo, uh, what we call limo company limo market, company, right? In yeah. all of other markets, captains are individual Independent freelancers. Individuals. And so to drive that stickiness towards yourself and to drive that sort of, I guess, uh, uh, that, that, that sort of love towards you, you guys have to make sure that, you know, what they earn is paid in time. Right. Yeah, and I, I I totally get that. Yeah, I, I and totally so that. so we're super excited about the captain opportunity, and then the one that's very dear to my heart is Kareem Pay One Click Checkout, which is a relatively newer product, but it's. So I'm jumping all over the place, but this links back to the profitability question you asked earlier. There are a number of assets that Kareem has built over the last decade that we can monetize, right? Mm -hmm. So what is Kareem Pay One Click Checkout for fintech? enthusiasts you will be familiar with bold fast etc yep. it's super simple right if you are a kareem user and we have 50 million registered kareem users in the region uh we're now live on sixstreet.com you should try the experience but if you're a registered kareem customer you'll see a big check out with kareem pay button and when you when you click that and do your one-time otp based authentication which is just the first time we'll populate your delivery address your cards on file your email address your phone number it's all pre-filled you don't need to add anything Checkout conversion obviously benefits. And for the user, it's just a super simple experience, right? Okay. And then you check out with the card on file that you have. And there what we're doing is we're monetizing not just the cards on file, but also identity, also locations, also et cetera, et cetera, all with user consent, of course. So that's our B2B play, mm -hmm. um, which we think is, is pretty unique. For this region, we don't see a homegrown competitor. So are you yet. going to expand into lending and other products? Eventually we will, because as you know, payments is hmm. extremely thin margins. Yeah. Right? So lending So we have to. And and I think that there are some very clear use cases for captains. It could be early wage access. It could be vehicle financing, vehicle insurance, right? And then uh, keep in mind- Send we have, now, pay later. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also merchants, right? We have restaurants. We have grocery yeah. providers that we work with. So you could do your working capital financing. There's, there's, a, whole there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do with the ecosystem, but yeah. it will have to happen um, to uh, to make the PNL come together. Okay, so let's talk, you, you said 13 different markets, right? And if I, if I ask you to just, you know, step out of the Kareem shoe, or stay in the Kareem, Kareem <laughs> shoes, That's it's your wish. Any particular market which really excites you in terms of the fintech opportunity? I mean, this is not going to be, this is going to be everyone's answer sitting on this couch. Three no. guesses. No, I'm not. I'm going to let you get, go for it. I think KSA is the big one, right? I mean, I think it's the, and probably one of the hardest ones. I mean, look, I think the, the combination of size and spending power is pretty unique. In the not region. Egypt? I mean, Egypt, listen, Egypt, I think Egypt and Pakistan are large markets. I was going to say, yeah. But their spending power is not at the same level, right? Agreed. And UAE, the spending power is fantastic, but it's a tiny market at the yeah. end of the day from a population perspective, right? Um, and frankly, it's also a bit of a bubble, the UAE. Things just work, right? Mm. Um, I think KSA is really the big one, I think, in terms of if you look at it from a TPV or GT, GMV or whatever acronym you want to use uh, perspective. Um, now, 
Egypt and Pakistan are interesting for different reasons. I think they're less guarded than KSA. Um, they're a bit less banked than KSA. But actually, they've already leapfrogged banks in some ways in the way that the UAE hasn't, right? If you think about it, UAE is actually a bit behind the curve. Infinite. The banking experience here is terrible. Yeah. But because, because this population has been so banked for so long, I don't think there's been an... Disruption hasn't been as important, whereas I think in markets like Egypt and or, Pakistan, or, or, fintechs or, have had to leap forward. Or, or, or the banks are just so happy that there's been a digital transformation. Yeah, but you see my point, right? Yeah, whereas, yeah. So the UAE is actually behind in fintech, I think, relative to Egypt, relative to Pakistan, in, in terms of the, KSA. Yeah, in terms of, I think, the sophistication of the problems that they're solving, I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen a lot of Me Too's out here, right? Mm -hmm. There, I, I think a lot of the fintech propositions which are in the UAE. So see, I spent 80% of my time in KSA, right? So so although I, 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 I you know, we're talking in Dubai, 80% mm -hmm. of my time mm -hmm. is spent there and 80% of that 80% of that time is spent with fintechs, okay. right? So I'm, I I do appreciate. And and I'll tell you, Mark, so, you know, I, I sit on, uh, I'm on an I'm on advisory board of one of the uh, Pakistani fintechs. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and I think uh, through them, I get a bit of a, a peek into the kind of problems that they're solving mm -hmm. in Pakistan. Obviously, I'm ethnically Indian. Mm -hmm. I see what's happening in India. It's not light years different than Pakistan, mm -hmm. maybe a few years ahead of the curve. Uh, I do agree with you that I think there's more, more sophistication. But I do think, I, I agree with you. I, I think it's a simple sort of, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a two horse race in terms of pure interest. I think Saudi Arabia is fascinating. Uh, I think I, I, I really like the way uh, you know, the Sama, CMA, and the wider ecosystems coming around. I think the public infrastructure with Saudi payments is built mm -hmm. is actually, you know, world-class out there. Okay. Um, Egypt is interesting to me just in pure numbers, right? It's 100 million people yeah. plus uh, so on and so forth. So will you be taking Kareem pay to all these markets with the same amount of uh, exuberance and enthusiasm and you know it's it's this has been such a debate because the way we used to launch ride hailing you can launch a city in 45 days and that's how we used to do it right, right. we used to we used to have this team called an expansion team and this was before my days at green but i've heard the war stories okay you would have this team called an expansion team and they would just be sent to a city with the target to launch the city in 45 days and with a huge amount of operational hustle and finding the guys and finding the cars and finding limo companies if there were no cars or finding someone to provide the cars and then doing a bit of guerrilla marketing and then just launch, right? Cannot do this in FinTech. No, you cannot. Um, and by the way, we used to do something similar in food. That took a little bit longer because you have to get restaurants on board. But still, it was like, let's say, a three-month effort to launch mm -hmm. a city, right? Now, at one point, uh, perhaps we may have thought we can turn on FinTech in 13 markets, but uh, thankfully, we decided not, not to even attempt to do that. And so we've decided we want uh, we want a great experience and demonstrate PMF market by market. Focus has been UAE. Uh, KSA is hopefully the next one. Uh, and then the other three on the list, because by the way, we're also not attempting necessarily to launch fintechs in 10 markets. Um, the other three on the list are Pakistan, Egypt, and Jordan. And so we'll get to them um, as well. But, so in uh, those markets, yeah. the super app will get launched, but fintech won't. Well, the super app will probably be a little bit ahead of Kareem Pay. Okay. So we will still not. So for example, we already have food delivery in Saudi. Yeah. Now we need to massively scale it up in Saudi. Mm -hmm. It's not at the same scale as it is in UAE in terms of its ranking on a, on a competitor list. But uh, we're going to scale that up. Uh, groceries might enter certain markets before Pay does. Um, but for Pay, look, we need licensing. Licensing is costly. Um, also, keep in mind with Pay, the tech is local. This is this is one of the other problems, right? Uh, we use the same tech stack for ride hailing food or groceries, no matter which market. Mm -hmm. But the local integrations that you need to launch fintech just mean that you need local partnerships, mm -hmm. local regulatory approvals, local integrations. Now, in some cases, we're trying to find regional providers, um, but ultimately, your bank is probably a local bank. Or domestic bank. No, no, it, you it's literally just, have to go back to the drawing board. Correct. Right? I, I had the fortune of, of uh, uh, fortune or misfortune, whichever we are saying, of being in, in, in your shoes a few years ago where I had eight markets, four in this part of the world, mm -hmm. four in Southeast Asia. And I literally realized, uh, well, I didn't literally realize, I, I practically realized that in every market I went, even in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. I literally had to go back to the drawing board 
every time again. Different partners, different regulations, yeah. different products, which were hooked products. And the offering has to be different, offering. right? Exactly. Now, so, you're not uh, 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 the kind of product, I mean... For us, we have very high hopes for our UAE to Pakistan remittance product, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if we go to Pakistan, probably we'll have to have a more uh, a product targeting sort of unbanked customers. Mm -hmm. um, here, we're not making a play for, like, we don't intend to launch a card in the UAE that's going to compete with some Emirates Skywards XYZ, right? Um, but in other markets, we might have a great card proposition. Mm -hmm. That is, so it's, so it's just the offering is. No, no, to I, so I totally agree with you, and 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 I can go on for hours giving you similar examples. I'm going to ask you one last question before we go to the sort of the third area which I want to discuss with you: regulation, mm. right? Um, where do you think, and where do you think more could be done by the regulator? to yeah. help what I call the non-banking players like you guys mm -hmm. really help address the challenges of the ecosystem? Look, for us, we are a regional company. That mm -hmm. is our DNA. We are the ride-hailing provider of the region, and we want to be the everything app of the region. So for us, obviously, passporting would be incredible. Mm -hmm. So some form of um, collaboration uh, among regulators across at least these five or six key markets, right? Uh, would be would be super super helpful, right? Uh, you 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 and me can both start hoping now. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe we start with two markets, three <laughs> yeah. markets. No, um, I do think some. Look, I think it'll. It's not just that it, it would. It, I save think some work. amount of it will happen. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think that for European fintechs, that's been a super great outcome, advantageous. right? Yeah. Um. So that would be one thing. The other thing I would say is not just on regulators, but also on the private sector. I think banking as a service needs to become a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, and on two fronts, one, regulators um, would be great for them to get comfortable with it, such that it becomes a pretty standard operating procedure so that fintechs can focus on the user and the user experience, right? Um, now, we, we obviously... In UA, do you think that's a regulatory issue or do you think that banks just don't want to do it? So I think it's both... Well, no, I'm... So I think it differs market by market. So in the UAE, we are live with a bank partnership. We decided to go live with a bank partnership mm -hmm. before getting our own license. Mm -hmm. So we are partnered up with FAB and with Magnati, right? And and frankly, getting that through the UAE Central Bank was not that challenging, right? Obviously, we had a great partner in well, FAB. Well, FAB. <laughs> yeah. So that certainly helped. Um, but for example, in KSA, that's been harder to land, right? So yeah. we started a year ago, more than a year ago, uh, trying to land a similar structure in KSA. And many of the banks that we spoke with said, but Sam has never approved such a thing. Yeah, right? uh, go product, There's no model for it. We don't even know how to put, like how this even look like. And like now one year later, things seem to be changing. Yeah, yeah. And our potential partners are having conversations with Sama. And now we're in those conversations. And that's fantastic. So it seems to be moving, but it's still not, they're not examples of it. Uh, live in many markets, right? Now, Egypt is a completely different story. Where Egypt, you have to have a banking partner. There is no such thing as a fintech license. Mm -hmm. So the answer is different by market. Um, but I think when it comes to the private sector piece of it, what providers in this situation need to provide, not just banks, but also others that are playing in various parts of this value chain, is that as tech companies and as uh, 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 companies obsessed with user experience, Man, we we can't get held back by outmoded ways of thinking about compliance or about the SLAs or about the speed at which we move or about creativity and innovation, right? So if they really want to be serious about this, they're going to have to sort of meet the needs of fintechs, which I think will mean raising the bar on service levels, responsiveness, customer experience. Um, and by the way, this is true for all providers. This is not a bank-specific topic. It's true of compliance providers, um, payment processing providers. And by the way, it's not just true of regional providers. We have some global providers whose, uh, whose performance just doesn't enable us to deliver the level of user experience that we want to deliver. And, and what do you expect, the regulators to drive that? No, no, this was a separate thing. This right, was what okay. I was saying. So the role regulators can play is start standardizing banking as a service partnerships. Sure, okay. And then the role the private sector can play is across the board, not just banks, but multiple providers. Um, just got to start thinking differently if you're going to be working with fintechs, right? Fair enough.
Okay, we're going to switch to a topic which has sort of has been an overarching theme for the season, uh, which is to do with sort of, you know, uh, the lack of gender diversity and specifically in the financial services sector, which I think is appalling, right? Um, it's a topic fairly close to my heart. I've got two young daughters. Mm -hmm. I want them to grow up to a, grow up in a world where, you know, there's some acceptance of the fact that the, your gender doesn't determine whether you get a job or not. Now, you're a great example, right, uh, who's, who's, who's sort of succeeded uh, even prior to Kareem in, you know, the, the big bad financial services mm -hmm. world, right? How big, is, how big is the issue according to you yeah. in this part of the world? And by the way, before I answer the question, I'll say this is, this is the hardest thing we're going to talk about in this conversation. Everything else that we've talked about might have sounded more complicated but this is way more complicated I agree with you. anything we've talked about until yep. this moment in this conversation I agree with you. because the solutions are non-obvious and all the technical stuff we spoke about the solutions are sort of known yep. or many of the solutions are known but i think this one is just challenging so how big is the problem the problem is big mm -hmm. um interestingly and i'm forgetting the stats off the top of my head and maybe i can send them to you later the proportion of stem graduates Actually, you were talking about financial services. Uh, but, talk. yeah, but but the proportion of STEM graduates in this region is actually quite high of mm -hmm. women graduating from STEM in okay. STEM disciplines. Um, and it's significantly higher than it is in the West. Okay. But that is clearly not translating into women in tech and senior women in tech, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a problem there. But even, let's say, financial services. I actually think in financial services, the representation is probably a little bit better than it is in tech. Mm -hmm. um, now, having worked in in finance in the U.S. Um, and now being sort of in fintech in this region, I do think this region has catching up to do. Um, I I did have more role models of senior women in finance um, when I was working at sort of global banks. Yeah. Um, J.P. Morgan, my previous company, has multiple senior women that are that are in the the layer right below JB Diamond. And of course we have uh, women CEOs running banks, et cetera, in the US. Now here in the region, we also do have a couple of examples of yeah, that, yeah, we do. but it's not the norm. Mm -hmm. um, but I would still say actually uh, tech is further behind than financial services, both in this region and in the US. My biggest fear is that I think, you know, so one of them is that, that which has been recognized is that, you know, start educating the kids early in the stage. And I think STEM also does impact kids coming into financial services because it's about getting people comfortable with numbers and mm. so on and so forth too, right? But I think there's a lot of conversation, there are a lot of, there's a lot of incrementalism, right? But actually the numbers continue to look worse in certain categories, mm. right? So does Madiha have a silver bullet? Silver idea? bullet, no. Uh, no, unfortunately I don't. So let me be very transparent. I don't have a silver bullet, but there are a couple of thoughts, right? One is... Not having role models sucks. It's a bad place to be bad. And, and, I, and I think that we don't even realize it, right? So it's not necessarily conscious, but I think it's an unconscious thing that when you don't see people like you in certain positions, I think you start imagining that it's not possible without even realizing, or you start holding yourself back in some way. And conversely, seeing people like you in certain positions inspires you and gives you hope that you don't even realize is happening. Yeah. So it's, I think it's a very subconscious thing, but I think the power of role models is super important. Now, this is a vicious chicken and egg situation, right? Um, now, how do we get those role models in place? I do think, despite the best of intentions, even if I'm going to be politically correct and say people have the best of intentions, I do think there is unconscious bias that seeps in when it comes to promotions, and, and when it bizarre. comes to leadership positions. But it's bizarre because diverse, there's enough evidence which says that there is correlation between diversity and economic Business success. gain. success, yeah. Right? So, so even if you're being incredibly selfish. So women spend more on the cream soup than men do. <laughs> no, no, the, the, we know these stats, That's right? awesome. Right. So when it comes to our customers, I think it's probably roughly an even split, but more of the spending is happening by okay. women. Right, and I don't know if it's because they're controlling household budgets more or whatever the case might be. Yeah. They're spending on the super app. Mm -hmm. One super interesting segment of people who use peer-to-peer -peer money transfer is people pooling money or sending money or sharing money having to do with their kids' class at school. 
in some way, shape or form. Okay. We're collecting a class yeah, fund yeah, for the yeah. teacher's yeah. birthday. We're collecting a class fund for X, Y, Z. Anyway, and, and by the way, not to stereotype, but it is a fact that it's moms that are doing more of this um, than fathers. Are. So point being, it makes business sense, right? But somehow, I think when it comes to those promotion decisions and those leadership decisions and who to retain and who we can let go and who can we can live without and who we can not live without, two things are happening. One, I think there is an unconscious bias. Well, actually, maybe three things are happening. I think I do think there is an unconscious bias. Um, second, I think there are structural or issues that are perceived as being structural issues that creates perhaps doubt about whether a woman in that position will be able to pull it off given her quote-unquote other responsibilities or her family obligations or X, Y, Z. Um, and I think these uh, I think these things are real, and they're happening even in organizations that one would think are progressive organizations. Yeah. Now I, I'll, I'll slow two ideas with you and tell me if, what, you know what do you think of them. And again, they're not silver bullets, but I do think it'll help. Uh, one is I think we should get people like you in front of young impressionable minds in their schooling environment mm. more often, right? Uh, I don't see enough of that happening, mm. right? Uh, I don't know if you think that that would help. But I think if there's a 13, 14 year old girl, um, you know, who who's starting to think about career, right? Starting to think about, you know, the last few years of her school mm. and which college she wants to go to. I think if they come across, you know, women of a certain uh, cohort who have succeeded in his technology, it's finance, it's medicine, doesn't matter, right? I, I think it, it leaves a much more impressionable, uh, 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 I guess, outcome for them to follow. The second thing is that, with all due respect, every time when we get forums of uh, women to talk about the issue of gender diversity, we tend to bring women who have already tackled it, mm. right? I think it would be better to actually bring along women whose careers got impacted because that gender diversity worked against them and let them actually say what the story yeah. was, right? And with all due respect. And by the way, who are in a position where they may be able to speak more openly. Exactly. Because they're not with that company anymore yeah. or working with uh, that person anymore. Or or, 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 or that or that entity. So I, I actually, and this is interesting because I was at a, at a, at a luncheon the other day organized, uh, very well organized, and there were seven, eight uh, 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 people in that session and there were eight very successful women mm. in finance. And they had great ideas, but I don't think any of them really struggled through, you know, uh, rising the, the, the ladder for whatever reason or the right. other. I would have preferred to have a mix of some of them and some of them who've actually struggled. I do think that that would give a, a, a more sort of, if I say, an uncut version of the truth as you just said it. Yeah. Um, in any case, that's just me. Uh, and, and I would add a, a third thing. Go ahead. I think I would have loved to get this training. I would still love to get this training. And maybe young women can get this training or girls in school can get this training, which is there is a very fine line between standing up for yourself, making your point and being considered unpleasant or aggressive or all of these words and labels. And for women, it's a particularly different, difficult balance to strike because of mental models, stereotypes, assumptions, etc. And I think because of that, we also don't aren't we don't advocate for ourselves enough. Yeah, we, we just don't. don't. I, I still don't enough for myself. And I know that men in my situation oh, no, they, would not take it lying down. Yeah, you see your own scores. Men, on an average, score themselves yeah. above the median. Correct. Women score themselves below the median. And even when that's even true in situations where men don't actually know the answer, but their level of confidence... <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, I see it at home. I see it with my husband. His level of confidence on all things right. is greater than mine. But also, I see it in the workplace. Yeah. And I would love some training around this, and for young women as well. And I guess that goes back to education. So, last question before we finish: uh, You're a successful executive, right? Any young uh, uh, female, um, whether that's tech, whether it's finance, doesn't make a difference. Two or three takeaways yeah. that they should consider as they're building their careers. Uh, one is focus on the learning. What are you going to learn? Don't focus on the money. Don't focus on the title. Focus on two things. One is learning. And the other is ownership. Um, don't stick to your JD. Demonstrate ownership. Um, and 
maybe in more traditional organizations, that's not the right answer, but hopefully you're not in a traditional organization in the year 2023 and you're doing something exciting and creative and innovative. Um, take ownership, right? And I have at least a couple of times taken a step back in my career because I knew it would bring me learning and opportunities for ownership and demonstrating that ownership. So Kareem was a great example. When I moved from, I was at a very senior position at JP Morgan when I moved to Kareem and because it was my first step into tech, I had to take a step back mm -hmm. on the career ladder. Um, but the learning in the last four and a half years about tech has been tremendous. And the level of ownership I've been able to take of a problem because tech companies are never have sufficient resources, are not overstaffed typically. You just need people to jump in and get stuff done, right? Um, and so I would say focus on learning, focus on ownership, no, and the rest will follow. And, 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 and you know, you, taking that step back doesn't necessarily mean you can't expedite your way back up because you bring all those learnings with you that you have, right? So seniority yeah. or having greater accountability is never a bad, hap never, never a bad yeah, thing if yeah. you have to take a step back because you do also have to recognize that, you know, you, you can't come with a sense of entitlement. Correct. Especially if you're moving sectors. Yeah. But yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. This, was, this uh, was super fun. Was it? It was. It really was. All right. Well, <laughs> this is great you know, fun. You could have there are better ways to spend a Saturday evening. No, no. Uh, well, Friday, I'll go out for dinner Friday, later tonight. But evening. until 6.30 is a fine thing to do. Perfect. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. Thank right. You. So everybody, that was Madhya Satar, uh, who heads the, um, well, she calls it payments, but I think it's payments in fintech and, and everything good. Uh, about the the Kareem Super app, uh, I I actually wish her and the rest of the Kareem team the best of luck uh, in terms of their their third chapter uh, and 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 their growth into a into a super app. Um, as I posted earlier today, um, it'll be an interesting uh, experience or an ex interesting s sort of playbook to watch from the sidelines, which I will very closely. Uh, but with that, uh, goodbye and till next week. Thank you.